Okay. Shall we get started, you think? Okay. Okay. Uh, given that we don't have a lot of time, I broke this lecture into Rob Hammer and other reliability and security issues. So my hope is that we'll be able to cover the Rob Hammer part at least, and then we'll continue with the other reliability and security issues tomorrow, and then uh, we'll start in-memory computation tomorrow also. But the reason I ordered things this way is because I think this is one other example why we need intelligent memory controllers. So far, I've been building explicitly or implicitly the need for intelligent memory controllers. Uh, as you know, uh, the reliability issues, the hybrid memories, and the need for uh, scheduling things in a much better way uh, requires intelligent memory controllers. And I think machine learning based memory controllers are one form of intelligence. The goal over there is not to do computation, of course, but the goal is to uh, manage the memory much better for high performance. But again, that's a form of intelligence, that data-driven design of the controller. So now I'll motivate Rohammer. Again, uh, I showed you this yesterday. Uh, I said we we're going to talk about all of these, and we'll uh, now talk about security, reliability, and safety. We've finished pretty much a lot of the background that I wanted to give you. Uh, but of course, we touched into a lot of research while going through the background material also. OK. So let's talk about this. Uh, essentially, this lecture is going to be about the story of Rohammer. I think this is another fascinating topic. Uh, essentially, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, this is the fact that you can predictably induce bit flips in commodity DRAM chips. And when we first did the testing, we found out that 80%, more than 80% of the tested DRAM chips are vulnerable to Rohammer. And as far as I know, uh, as far as uh, and I didn't see any example saying uh, anything contrary to this so far. It's really the first example of how a simple hardware failure mechanism can create a widespread system security vulnerability uh, in a programmatic way, essentially. You can basically program uh, an application and it can take advantage of this hardware fa failure mechanism and leads to a system security vulnerability. As a result, I showed you this also, people are writing popular articles like this, forget software, uh, hackers are now exploiting physics. And there's a lot of truth to this in terms of how a row hammer is done. But before I go into Roll Hammer, let me motivate uh, things from a human perspective also. Does anybody know who this is? There's a side channel over here, of course. But does anybody know who this is Not <laughs> beyond the name? <laughs> yes? It's Abraham Maslow. He's a very famous American psychologist. That's right, yes, this triangle design. <laughs> it's basically this uh, hierarchy of needs. He's more famous that, for this than his name, probably. He basically came out with the hierarchy of needs that's very heavily used in psychology and eco economics also, actually. People motivate economic designs and uh, policies and et cetera based on this hierarchy of needs. He had a lot of influence in social sciences. But basically, he's a person who dedicated his life to understanding why human beings do the things they do. That's this is his book that he kept writing for a long time, uh, which is an effort that started much earlier, of course, as you can see over there. Uh, and basically, he came up with this hierarchy of needs that says, you really ha need to have your basic needs satisfied first before you can think about psychological needs, like belongingness, love, friendship, esteem, and before you can think about highest form of abstract art. I think Vienna is very uh, luxurious in that sense, right? There's a lot of highest forms of abstract art over here, because a lot of these needs were satisfied before, probably. <laughs> but this needs to be satisfied. Uh, as a result, I think this is true for computers also. Basically, we need to start with the very basics. If you want to get high performance, energy efficiency, dot, 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 forget about that. You really need to first start with reliability and security because if you don't have a reliable and secure computing system, nothing that you will build on top of that would be useful perhaps, right? As we will show over here. I also use this picture when I motivate uh, Rohammer uh, in my class. And I introduce it to my freshman class actually. Uh, does anybody know what this is? I guess there is actually a side channel over here, but that's not a great side channel. I'm gonna close this door because OK, maybe you can do it for me. Thanks. Do you know what this bridge? Exactly. So you know about this. Where did you hear about this? Oh, OK, picture in the video. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. It was built over, uh, I used to work at Microsoft Research very close to this. I crossed this bridge. Actually, technically, it's not this bridge. It's the bridge that replaced it <laughs> many, many times. It's over the Hood Canal. Uh, it's a beautiful peninsula uh, over there. Uh, but essentially, uh, it was built in 1940, and this is what happened to it six months later. Uh, and the reason was, it's, a, it's a really a reliability problem, basically. It was doing this because of air aesthetic flutter, and 
at some point, the people, while people were trying to figure out why it was doing it, it just snapped. <laughs> and uh, this is what happened to it. I, I like this example because I think this is like a bit flip, right? A bit flips and all of your security, safety, and reliability, all of them at the same time are gone. In this case, it was not a huge security issue. It was more of a safety issue, perhaps. But it could easily be a security issue, right? This reliability problem. It's fundamentally a reliability problem. It's a failure mechanism that causes this. And in this case, I think only one uh, dog died. <laughs> but as you will see later on, not all of the bridge incidents uh, are that uh, uh, are as less costly as this one. Okay, so think about this. I think this is a bit flip example over here. This is another example that I use also to motivate freshmen. These folks who are constructing Manhattan at that time after World War, uh, they're very happy at this point in time, but the infrastructure that they're on, if it has a bit flip, they will not be happy a second later, right? So I, essentially I view security as preventing unforeseen consequences. It's a very broad definition, of course. Uh, but I think if you really want to be secure, you really need to be able to prevent or adapt to these unforeseen consequences. And if your infrastructure has reliability problems, then you have a big problem. And I think today, this is especially more important than in the past. Because today, uh, we're trying to go into a regime where we rely a lot more on the infrastructure that we design, right? It's not just the physical infrastructure, it's the computing infrastructure that's more softer than the physical infrastructure, in fact. Uh, if you have bit flips all over the place in your infrastructure, then your cars may be making the wrong decision, right? Your self-flying drones or whatever could be making the wrong decision. So today I think we need to be even more rigorous about reliability issues, security issues, and safety issues. And I club them together in this talk. They're, all, they're of course, clearly different things, right? Reliability is uh, a way of satisfying correct operation. Uh, safety it has different implications than security because you may be secure but not safe, right? And vice versa. Uh, but I think bit flips actually cause problems with all of them at the same time. Okay, so we'll get back to these pictures. Uh, essentially, we talked about the DRAM scaling problem yesterday, and I think DRAM scaling problem leads to a lot of bit flips. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail again, but very quickly. Uh, DRAM stores charge in a capacitor. This is the storage unit. This is the access unit. And for both, uh, for, 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 for the DRAM cell to work, both the storage unit and the access unit must be reliable. Right? As you reduce the size of the cell to smaller technology nodes, both of the uh, units become uh, hard to maintain as reliable, as we discussed yesterday. And we said that this was the value that was assigned to X by ITRS in 2009. They said reducing the size of the feature size of the cell below 35 nanometers is challenging. They didn't say it's impossible, they said challenging. And today, as we discussed yesterday, we're at 17 nanometers, right? Clearly, we went beyond, far beyond 35 nanometers. And people are going to push even more beyond 17 nanometers. When I go to visit DRAM companies and give a talk there, I like asking the question, what do you think is the scaling limit of the DRAM cell in terms of feature size? What is the minimum feature size we are ever going to achieve before it becomes unreasonable to reduce the DRAM cell? What do you think the best answer I've got so far is? Any guesses? Four. Four. Any other takers? Well, the be best answer I got so far was seven. <laughs> so they're not very optimistic also. <laughs> but of course, who knows, maybe they will come out with some clever design. And they've been coming up with a lot of clever designs, actually. If this picture doesn't do any justice to it, I have some other pictures somewhere else. Maybe we'll look into it. But uh, today, the way this DRAM is designed, this capacitor is really etched into uh, the, uh, um, uh, the wafer in a 3D manner. The size of this capacitor, the depth of this capacitor is 90 times the size of the transistor on top of it. So to, to actually get very high densities, they're really digging deep in the silicon. <laughs> That's unfortunate, as you can see, right? That's, because if they actually don't dig deep, the capacitor becomes much larger and wider, and your density is not high. Uh, OK, and they store very little charge in this capacitor. OK, anyway, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, as the size of the cell reduces, you get into reliability problems. And we did the study that I mentioned yesterday that shows that chip density is very positively correlated with the failure rate. As chips become denser, you get more higher failure rates. And as I said, you can read this paper for more detail in that study. I'm not going to cover this more. And as I also said, we were doing a lot of experiments using RFPGA-based infrastructure to understand some of these scaling and reliability problems. And actually, 
the reason we built this infrastructure is to understand the retention time properties of DRAM cells. This is a DRAM infrastructure. It's a, this is the first incarnation. You have, we have these FPGA boards that, are, that can essentially test memory that are attached to them. And we have our makeshift fans and heaters, as you can see. They're not as fancy at the time. Uh, and we wanted to understand the retention time properties of different cells because we knew that refresh is a huge problem and we wanted to understand the refresh problem to solve the refresh problem. And uh, if you remember yesterday, we had this Raider paper, Retention Aware Intelligent DRM Refresh, that doesn't work and we wanted to make it work. That's why we built this infrastructure and we studied a bunch of other things. And this was the next generation infrastructure and this was the next generation. This is actually the infrastructure where we uh, did the initial row hammer studies and uh, wrote the paper with that's the Rohammer paper. And this is the infrastructure in, in around 2017, uh, which we open sourced, as I mentioned yesterday also. So if you want to do more studies and discover more Rohammer type of errors, this is the infrastructure to use perhaps. Uh, and as I said yesterday, uh, we looked at, initially we wanted to understand the data retention time profile of DRAM chips, and we basically found or confirmed the fact that you have this sort of radio retention profile. You don't need to refresh everything every 64 milliseconds. You can get away without, uh, with refreshing things, w w w most of the cells every 256 milliseconds. In fact, uh, uh, many cells retain data for hundreds of seconds. It's really amazing, uh, especially at low temperatures. If you're operating at low temperatures like 25 degrees, 30 degrees, you can count on uh, DRM retaining a lot of the data. But there are some uh, weak cells that lose charge very quickly. Uh, the fact that uh, the DRAM retains a lot of charge was uh, used by attackers in the past. Uh, do you know about cold boot attacks? The idea of cold boot attacks is basically you steal someone's phone, let's say, uh, and you basically put the memory into a freezer or keep it cold as much as possible. Uh, as the memory is cold, it's not, it's not leaking as much. As a result, now it retains most of the data it has, and then you have a way of extracting that data out of memory. And now you can actually get the data with this cold boot attack, if you will. Uh, of course, how realistic these attacks are in general, uh, because you need to ensure that you don't lose the data as much. But if, the, if most of the cells, if the critical data is in those cells that are retaining data for hundreds of seconds or minutes, then you can get that critical data, right? You need to be quick, basically, to get that data out. Uh, so we're exploiting that observation that most cells are strong. Of course, it's not an easy thing because that's, that's why we built the infrastructure. We wanted to understand which locations are strong, which locations are weak. Is there a pattern to these locations? There is no pattern. It's all random. Actually, the locations that are weak are actually in random locations. Uh, but there's a pattern to the value pattern. Uh, some, uh, uh, some value patterns cause a lot of capacitance coupling between the cells as a result. They, uh, they, they lead to uh, lower retention times. So the value of the cell and the cells around it affect the retention time. And we, uh, we actually studied this variable retention time phenomenon where the access transistor becomes leaky randomly. And I'm going to talk about these in other reliability issues later on. But this is fascinating. And if, if you want to exploit this, you really need an intelligent controller. No question about that. And this is a paper that uh, we first wrote using our infrastructure that looks at the data retention behavior in modern uh, DRAM devices. And then later we wrote other papers talking about how do you mitigate the retention failures. Uh, and we kept, we were writing a lot of papers on uh, retention time, which we will talk about. But while we were doing these studies, we also wanted to, since we had this infrastructure, we also wanted to study other issues in DRAM. Uh, and one of the issues that we wanted to study was read disturb errors. Uh, we were also doing studies with our flash infrastructure that I will show you later on. Flash memory has a lot of error mechanisms like read disturb mechanism. Whenever you read a row, rows around it are disturbed, meaning that you, you, you affect the rows. And we wanted to study whether this effect exists in commodity DRAM uh, also. And essentially, we found out that that is the case. Uh, you can predictably induce errors in most DRAM memory chips. And this is now known very well as the row hammer problem. But it's essentially a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. So what is happening? Essentially, uh, all memory consists of rows, as we've discussed yesterday. In DRAM, if you want to uh, read a cell or a value from a row, you need to activate that row. Activation means apply high voltage to the word line. Now, if you want to read some other row in the same bank, you need to deactivate that row, meaning precharge the array, meaning apply low voltage to this. Now, if you keep doing this repeatedly, activate precharge, activate precharge, activate precharge, activate precharge, activate precharge, to the same row, over and over, enough times 
before the cells get refreshed. It turns out in most modern memory chips, vulnerable bits in adjacent, in physically adjacent rows flip from 1 to 0 or 0 to 1, depending on how the encoding. Basically, they lose charge. They lose enough charge that you cannot recover the data in those vulnerable cells. And we call this the hammer row. We call these the victim rows. And we showed that in most real DRAM chips you can buy today, this effect exists. We're going to talk about the reasons for it. But one reason is cells are too close to each other. Uh, and you have electromagnetic coupling between the word lines, uh, the word line that you're hammering and the word lines that you're uh, that are adjacent. So when you're actually hammering this word line, when you're applying high voltage to it, these are not electrically completely isolated. You're really applying a small amount of voltage to this also because things are not isolated. And that small amount of voltage is opening some of the cells very slightly. And the vulnerable cells leak some charge. And they leak charge little by little in each activate. And if you do enough activates before the cells get refreshed, you may actually leak enough charge that you, can, you, you cannot recover the data in those vulnerable cells. So it's a very fundamental mechanism. It's read disturbance, basically. Whenever you're reading this row, you're really disturbing the adjacent rows. It exists in all memories, as far as I know. It exists in hard disk. It exists in SRAM. It exists in PCM. But in DRAM, it's fundamentally programmatic, because in DRAM, DRAM is directly exposed to your programming language, as we will see. And it's a scaling problem. So basically, this is the initial test that we did in this paper. We showed that more than 80% of uh, the chips that we've tested show this effect. They're vulnerable to this row hammer problem, essentially. And ignore these numbers over here. It depends on how you do the testing. Actually, our testing was not the most aggressive. Later, people developed tests that could lead to even more errors uh, on the chip. And this is a scaling problem because this problem really didn't get exposed in chips that were manufactured between 2000, uh, before 2010, essentially. Essentially, the error rates with the tests that we've done are zero for chips that were manufactured before 2010. But all of the chips that were manufactured, that we tested between 2012 and 2013, are actually vulnerable to this problem, irrespective of the manufacturer. And the error rates depend on the chip generation, the manufacturer. Uh, basically, it's not a single manufacturer's problem. It's really an industry-wide problem. Industry hit a scaling point where these read-disturb errors uh, could not be avoided uh, at this point. That's the idea, of course. Of course, they could have essentially predicted it, but let's not go into that at this point right now. Uh, the mindset is different, right? The mindset was not uh, to really protect these, uh, for these issues as much. And DRAM has always been thought of as perfect memory. There was no, uh, you don't even have ECC in uh, most of our DRAM today, right? It's going to change in the future, but uh, until now, we didn't have even ECC. And we're going to talk about whether ECC can solve this problem. But I'm getting ahead of myself. But this is a scaling problem. Basically, cells got too close to each other after some point that they start affecting each other much more. In the past, this effect already also existed. Right? Uh, you could actually, whenever you activate a row, you're disturbing some other rows. But the number of disturbances, number of activates you needed to do were so many that you couldn't fit enough activates to a refresh interval. That's the idea. So the effect existed, but it didn't get exposed because you would refresh the cells before you would cause a row hammer problem. But the number of activates that you needed to do to disturb the cells or to, leak, uh, to basically corrupt the cells became lower than what you could fit in a refresh interval in 2010. And as a result, you started seeing these errors in a, within a refresh interval. OK, so why is this happening? I already said that DRAM cells are too close to each other. They're not electrically isolated enough from each other. Access to one cell affect the affects the value in nearby cells due to the electrical interference between the cells and the wires used for accessing the cells. We're going to see this interference even more in refresh later on. This is also called cell-to-cell -cell coupling or cell-to-cell -cell interference. One example mechanism is uh, uh, when we activate or apply high voltage to a row, an adjacent row gets slightly activated as well. And as a result, vulnerable cells in that slightly activated row lose a little bit of charge. If row hammer happens enough times, charge in such cells gets drained, basically. And again, this has higher level implications. It's a simple circuit level failure mechanism. And I, as people have shown that, it has an enormous implication on upper levels of the transformation hierarchy. Actually, I saw some report today. Um, there was a paper called Rambleed that was published in IEEE Security and Privacy that, that was exposed, I think, very recently. I hadn't seen it before because I, before I, because I was traveling. But that's actually an example of another attack on Ro, uh, using row hammer. They have these creative names called Rambleed. 
basically they showed that using row hammer you could uh, get information about uh, the value of cells, uh, memory locations that you're not supposed to get information uh, on. Okay, uh, but I think the attacks can be even more direct uh, as we will see. Essentially, you, uh, we will have problems at uh, the higher levels of the stack because of the simple, hard, simple bit flip. Why? Because these, these bit flips can be induced by user level programs like this. So this is the program that we wrote when we released the paper. Uh, it's actually on our GitHub also. You can download it, use it on your computer, hammer yourself if you want. <laughs> I would probably back up any critical data that you would have before because you may not be able to reboot your system, right, if you hammer the wrong bits. It happens. It's not the common case, but it could happen. So basically what this program does, it's a user level program. It's an x86 program. Uh, it could be optimized even further. But what this does is it uh, selects addresses X and Y such that they map to the same bank. This program does not do the perfect job, but there are other programs that other people have developed later on who reverse engineer all of the bank address mappings that we discussed yesterday. And if you reverse engineer all of those mappings, you can make this program much more effective, actually. We didn't do that. We just wanted to show the proof of concept uh, that these errors can be inducible uh, at the user level. That's what we wanted to show initially. Later, people improve these programs a lot more than we, uh, we could have done at the time. Uh, so you choose addresses X and Y such that they map to the same bank. And basically, uh, you ensure that they don't stay in the caches and they don't stay in the row buffer. Which means that you avoid cache hits and you avoid row hits, which enables this, right? You basically keep ping-ponging activates to rows X and Y. And you do it forever, essentially. And, and then you test the memory and you see that adjacent rows have bit flips uh, if the chip is vulnerable. Okay, that's the idea. And we tested this on the machines that we had at the time and all of them exhibited these errors, and errors have some correlation with how fast you can access memory, and all of the memory controllers that I know of today are capable of issuing enough activates to induce row hammers in a vulnerable chip today. I mean, you could, you could argue that the, there are some idiosyncrasies, of course, but the access rate is low. That's why you don't get a lot of errors in this particular controller, but this was just uh, our chance. Other AMD controllers are pretty good at <laughs> inducing a lot of errors uh, also. This doesn't mean that, uh, this, this just means that this particular uh, machine did not have a very high access rate. Okay, so it's a real reliability and security issue. It's, you can induce these errors. A program may naturally be inducing these errors. There are actually some anecdotal evidence that, uh, actually there's some real evidence that some programs actually do this, but it's not the common case clearly, right? Not all programs really go to memory, but you could imagine cases where many threads contend for the same lock and the lock is not cached and they're all hammering uh, the same bank. And in those cases, you actually uh, see these errors and they're very, very, very hard to debug in real life. <laughs> so that's, a, that's an example of a reliability problem. But more, of a reli more than a reliability problem, this is a security problem because somebody can intentionally do this. There's nothing that prevents them from doing this. And as a result, the whole system is completely vulnerable. And that's what, what's what we said in the paper. Basically, the first sentence the paper starts with is, Memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system, and access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. I believe this is very fundamental. We should really maintain this invariant. But Rohammer uh, essentially violates that invariant. As a result, we said that you could easily hijack a computer. We didn't really uh, construct a full attack, but we said that it's easy to uh, develop an attack uh, that could take over the system, that could crash the computer. Basically, you can do many, many things with this. Of course, hijacking is the worst part. And while we were looking into the attack, these good folks from Google Project Zero published a blog post that essentially showed uh, what we said. They basically uh, exploited, they called the DRAM row hammer bug. I, I don't like calling it a bug because I think it's a really a fundamental failure mechanism. Uh, uh, basically, uh, they exploited the fail row hammer failure mechanism to gain kernel privileges. And this is beautiful security engineering. They did actually a great job and I copy paste, all of these sentences are copied and pasted from their uh, blog post. Uh, they also have a black hat presentation uh, on this, Thomas Seaborn and, uh, no, Mark Seaborn and Thomas Dullian. Uh, basically they said that they learned about the problem from our work and they tested a selection of the laptops and they showed that this is real. Uh, it's funny that uh, the paper that we wrote on Rohammer was first rejected from Micro saying that people didn't believe this. <laughs> and then we submitted it again to ISCA and it got these really wide reviews. Some people really loved it, some reviewers, some reviewers really hated it, said one, 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 
basically the lowest possible score you could get saying that this is not a problem. <laughs> That's why you should take the reviews with a grain of salt. <laughs> Uh, but, but these folks at Google Project Zero apparently believed after the paper is published. So if you didn't publish the paper, then they, they wouldn't be able to develop this attack clearly. But they believed us and they basically built two working privilege escalation exploits that use the effect. And uh, you can read uh, uh, this blog post and I would definitely recommend reading it. It's beautiful security engineering. One of the escalation, uh, privilege escalation exploits is not that interesting to me. Basically, it takes over the Google native client Okay, that's fine. It's a virtual machine that you could uh, get out of the sandbox of. But the other uh, exploit is very, very interesting. It basically induces Rohammer bit flips to gain kernel privileges on x 64 Linux as a user level process. You have no other permissions. You induce these bit flips and then you take over the system. And the way they did it is very nice. Basically, uh, I'll give you the high level idea. Uh, the process that's running was able to induce bit flip in the page table entries. Uh, uh, that point to its own page table. And by doing so, it was able to gain write access to its own page table by flipping the right bits. And once you gain write access to your own page table and you know the page table structure, you can do anything to the machine, right? Because now you can actually gain, change your permissions such that you can gain write access to all of, your, all of the physical memory. That's essentially what they did. Of course, it's not as easy as I described, right? Because yeah, you, you get a bit flip and you need to ensure that that lands in the correct location, right? And that correct location may be anywhere. You may lead to a system crash. Before leading to a system crash, you need to actually ensure that you take over the system. Of course, crashing the system is also not good. It's also a security issue, but it's less of a security issue than being hijacked. So they actually do a very good job explaining how they do it and I would recommend reading it. Uh, you cannot attack just a, a write enable bit uh, of, of a page table entry, right? Because that's only a single bit in a large 32-bit page table entry. The probability of attack is very low in that case. You really need to spray the memory with lots of page tables and you really uh, want to be able to change the pointer to a page table uh, such that you actually gain write access to it. Okay, that's what they did essentially, but I'm not going to go into the details of it uh, because otherwise we'll talk about just the attacks. Uh, what else was I, uh, what I, uh, did I want to say over here? Yeah, okay, basically this was the first attack that was developed on top of Rohammer and uh, people start drawing pictures like this. Clearly, is it the end of memory? I don't think it's the end of memory. I think this problem is solvable actually uh, and it's going to be solved. Uh, but I like the insight that some people um, say. This is from a famous hacker. Uh, he tweeted something like this basically. It's like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming a neighbor's door until the vibrations open the door you're after. So if you happen to be stuck in this hot room, start banging on the wall such that you magically open one of the windows, right? If, if somehow they're locked otherwise. So this is actually a very good way of uh, capturing the insight of the problem. It's really a uh, perturbation issue, right? Okay, uh, so let me go into, uh, basically there are a lot of attacks that were developed and the paper that I assigned as required reading for you covers them at a very broad stroke. So if you can read a lot of papers, it doesn't cover the latest IEEE security and privacy paper rambled because it happened after our paper was released. But uh, you can download source code also. Actually, Google, uh, Google's attack was also interesting. It exploited another observation we made in the paper. We said that uh, a row is vulnerable on both sides, meaning that if you activate, if you sandwich the row that's vulnerable, and if you ping pong the activates in both of the adjacent rows, you could increase the attack probability much more, bit flip probability much more. And they did that exactly. We observed this, but we didn't really do it in our source code because we really didn't want to go into the reverse engineering. We just wanted to show the proof of concept. But they did it and they showed that you could actually, the attacks are actually much worse uh, than what we showed. And later, other people showed other stuff. Uh, basically, they got rid of the CL flush. You could actually induce these bit flips without flushing the cache lines by, by ensuring that cache lines are gone by, uh, by causing interference in the, uh, in the cache set. Uh, and they were able to actually trigger faults on remote hardware, essentially, basically. Uh, it requires nothing but a website with JavaScript. And uh, they showed that you can, they can gain unrestricted access to systems of website visitors. This is actually very interesting. This is one of the first attacks. And th these folks tried to uh, provide some software-based protection mechanisms, but they also showed that you could do Rohammer without uh, CL flush. And they also propose software-based monitoring for Rohammer detection. We're going to talk about 
solutions, but software-based solutions are one solution. I don't believe these are easy to implement uh, in real life. Uh, okay, then other people showed other stuff, like uh, the, these folks actually showed that uh, you could use row hammer and memory deduplication to overtake a browser. Uh, basically, uh, memory deduplication, uh, you have two virtual pages from two different processes, and uh, they point to the same page because they happen to have the same content. And these folks exploited the fact that these two processes shared uh, this page, and they hammered uh, this particular page, and they caused a bit flip, which means that you now actually cause a problem in some other process because memory is deduplicated. And later, pe uh, people turned off memory deduplication in virtual machines so that these attacks are not doable. <laughs> That's one way of solving the problem. Of course, memory duplication is good because it increases your effective memory capacity, right? You don't want to turn, on, turn off something useful to protect against these attacks. Uh, okay, and then there are other uh, papers. Uh, I'll, I'll go through these relatively quickly, but uh, I think you can look at it on your own. Yeah, they're, they're very, very interesting attacks, basically. People are very creative. Oh, I wanted to say, uh, this actually, the, the, the importance of bit flips was known to the security community very well. Uh, there's this paper, I believe it's in 2001, Oakland. Don't quote me on the 2001, it could be 2003 also. It's from Andrew Apple's group. And, uh, they did a very uh, cute thing, and the idea was essentially uh, they wanted to take over a virtual machine, and I think the paper is titled something like that, taking over a virtual machine uh, by uh, using memory faults. Uh, and what they did was they actually uh, took a heating source physically to a, a computer, and they heated the memory. And this caused a lot of bit flips, and they took advantage of these bit flips to essentially take over the Java virtual machine gain uh, access to the Java virtual machine. And they have, they have a beautiful attack. I would recommend reading that paper. But of course, this is not a very feasible attack because now you need to have physical access to the machine. And also, if you actually put a heating source to your memory, it induces a lot of bit flips. It could crash your system earlier than you could actually cause the attack. So people knew the importance of bit flips, but they didn't know how to actually cause them in a programmatic way. Rohammer provides the first programmatic way of inducing these bit flips in a very predictable way also, basically. That's why all of this work in security got triggered. Uh, it's amazing to imagine that you just need a real bit flip, right? People who could have done all of this research and simulation also. It's, it's good to think about it in hindsight. But I guess security community doesn't necessarily work that way. They, don't, they have to really have the vulnerability in their hands to, uh, to develop the attacks. But you could imagine developing these attacks in a simulation, right? <laughs> Maybe it's, it's a bit harder to do. We'll talk about simulation later on. Okay, mm. so I would recommend that paper. It's Andrew Apple's group, uh, Attacking a Virtual Machine Using Memory Faults or something like that. I believe it's IEEE Security Privacy 2001 or 2003. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly, but there are basically lots of attacks uh, that people developed and clearly I don't have all of them over here. I'm gonna uh, show this one because I think this is very interesting also. Uh, but this is also very interesting. Uh, again, this also uses memory duplication row hammer and it basically breaks open SSH public key authentication uh, by having a malicious virtual machine that can gain unauthorized access to a hosted VM. Again, for the details of the attacks, you should read the papers. Okay, there's just, I cannot keep up with these, uh, but I like having this because uh, it's good to uh, know. And this enabled us to actually have a good literature survey that you're going to read. <laughs> Uh, okay, so actually, uh, I'll, I'll cover a couple of things. This is actually very interesting. This was one of the first things that, uh, that uh, first reactions to Rohammer. It was in 2014, after we published the paper. These folks who develop uh, MemTest programs, MemTest 86 programs were very worried. And they actually uh, say they read the paper, it's characterized over there, and they basically say, uh, the Hammer test is designed to detect RAM modules that are susceptible to disturbance errors caused by charge leakage. This phenomenon is described, blah, blah. Uh, okay, they basically tested, uh, created a test, and these are, these are tests that you would run uh, on your computer when it boots up, for example, or once in a while. Uh, you run to test whether your memory is corrupt or not. Uh, the interesting thing is this one. Apparently, after they released this test, a lot of people sent them emails saying that we're getting a lot of errors with this test, with this hammer test. And they basically say the errors t detected during test 13, albeit exposed only in extreme memory access cases, are most certainly real errors. So don't worry about them, they're real. <laughs> we know about this. <laughs> I like that one. And they also actually have uh, interesting uh, uh, analysis. So these uh, memory testing folks are actually 
very good at adopting the solutions relatively quickly, as you can see. Okay, when we first wrote the paper, we said that you could actually develop a disturbance attack uh, and we construct a proof of concept. I'm gonna go through some of these interesting works. This actually shows that you could take over a machine remotely uh, and gain unrestricted access to systems of website visitors. This was the one that I promised to talk a little bit more about. Uh, people were concerned that, oh, okay, you, you cannot do this. Uh, you can do this on Intel uh, and AMD processors, but I mean, when we wrote the paper, we said that you could do it on any processor that can do me access memory fast enough. So uh, these folks showed that you could do it on ARM processors. There's nothing special about any of these processors. As long as you have a good memory controller, which all of the memory, <laughs> all of the processors have today, you could actually cause these row hammer bit flips. But this paper was very interesting because they released an app on the Android system which essentially could take over your phone. I think they, it's still there. You can try it out and see if you're hijacked. Uh, what they did was they were, uh, they, uh, they, the, the operating system had predictable memory allocation patterns, uh, the Android operating system. I don't know if it still has. Uh, they were, uh, what they did was they profiled the machine. They figured out which parts of the memory were vulnerable to row hammer bit flips, most vulnerable, and they, later alloc uh, uh, wrote a program that created some allocation patterns that fooled the operating system to allocate a page table entry belonging to this process to a location, to a memory location that's vulnerable to row hammer. And because the memory uh, allocation patterns are predictable and you know the algorithms, you could do that. And then they hammered that page. And they were predictably able to gain access to their own page table, write access to their own page table by doing that. And that's why this was a deterministic attack. It was not a probabilistic attack up to this point because they, because they knew exactly how the operating system behaved. So it's actually very, very clever, I think. Of course, the solution could be ensuring that you hide the algorithms from the uh, people, right? Uh, but maybe they will reverse engineer that also. Uh, this fo uh, the same folks actually showed that you could do these attacks much faster using the GPU because GPU can access memory much faster. So you could accelerate these row hammer attacks in a mobile unit and they showed that you could escalate privilege with the WebGL interface uh, in a mobile system. Uh, the, uh, other folks showed that you could actually do these attacks through the RDMA interface, remote direct memory access interface that allows you access to the memory of some other computer. And you could row hammer some other computer through this interface, which is very, very interesting also. And these folks actually had the same idea and published the same paper at the same time uh, concurrently. And I'm gonna skip this one because this actually talks about some other work that we've done that's similar to row hammer. Okay, maybe this is another security implication. If your computer is having bit flips, get rid of it, right? And this is one way of getting rid of it. <laughs> I don't think that's a solution. Again, this is, the, this is the joke part of it. So I believe there are more security implications actually. As, uh, as we predicted, uh, people, security community is very creative and they keep coming with new attacks and they're gonna keep coming with even more attacks going forward. I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, I think they're having a bit difficulty right now because DDR3 is very vulnerable. DDR4 is, there are some reports that there, it is vulnerable, but it's not clear, it's not, it's easy, easily vulnerable. Because there are some solutions that are employed in the field which we will briefly talk about. They may not be perfect solutions. There are some leakage in the solutions. Under some conditions you could generate these attacks. But a lot of the publications are on DDR3, which is now becoming an older technology. Going forward, we'll see if there are more works that will happen on DDR4. Uh, so let's, before we go into solutions, let's talk about understanding this phenomenon a little bit because uh, we wanted to fundamentally understand why this is happening and how can we prevent it and uh, what are the conditions under which this is bad or good. Uh, so the first thing is the root causes. Actually, this is not easy uh, to, this is, uh, uh, a lot of people do circuit simulations and these sort of attacks are very difficult to model in circuit simulations. You cannot really find this in circuit simulations because you need to model all of these things. So hammer is really a combination of multiple effects and we actually confirmed with at least one manufacturer uh, who shall, I guess, still remain nameless. <laughs> Even though manufacturers are very good at now admitting the row hammer problem, uh, initially they don't want to admit it. I don't know why. I think they should just embrace it and solve the problem, right? That's, uh, but uh, uh, two, two manufacturers actually uh, confirmed that it's really a combination of effects. And the effects are getting worse as the circuit scales to smaller technology nodes. And one cause is electromagnetic coupling, as we discussed. Another cause is conductive bridges. Sometimes conductive bridges get formed between two rows, for example, two cells, and that lead to very fast charge leakage. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details. And in some rare cases, some hot carriers get injected into some cells that lead to, again, 
permanent corruption in the cells or semi-permanent corruption in the cells. Again, it's really a combination of these effects. Sometimes one effect is more dominant, but this is really hard to model at the low levels. You really need to have a mechanism to predict and anticipate these errors. Uh, you cannot just model them and say, okay, I'm gonna be vulnerable to roll hammer at some point. And that's exactly why we developed this infrastructure to test these issues, to understand uh, uh, with real uh, chip testing. Okay, and this is the infrastructure where we actually discovered the issue. And this is from the original paper. Basically, we tested 129 modules from three major manufacturers. And there are really three major manufacturers in DRAM today. It didn't used to be the case, but a lot of things got consolidated. All of the other manufacturers are actually on the fringes. Uh, I assume you know, you know the three major manufacturers, right? They shall remain nameless, but it's Samsung, Micron, and Hynix, SK Hynix today. Uh, and uh, basically, we wanted to study uh, like what, uh, what are the parameters of the uh, mechanism? So I showed you most modules are problematic. I showed you that it's really a scaling problem and error actually is because of charge loss. I didn't show you that, but it's in the paper. Let's take a look at some of the other things over here. One is the adjacency of the aggressor and the victim. Uh, and this is adjacency in terms of the uh, difference uh, between the row addresses of the hammered row and the victim rows. So how, how, different, how, uh, how far apart they are from each other in the address space. Zero is the aggressor row's address, plus one and minus one are uh, the logically uh, next addresses. But this is logical, remember. Logical adjacency in terms of address space doesn't mean physical adjacency because internally addresses get remapped in DRAM. DRAM does this internal address remapping that's not exposed to anybody else, including the memory controller. So as a result, uh, you need to look at this. So it turns out for, uh, this is, these are the worst chips from each of the manufacturers. It turns out for this particular manufacturer, there's not a lot of remapping. Most of the addresses uh, uh, are adjacent. Victim uh, and aggressors are adjacent to each other. But some other manufacturers like this one, most of them are adjacent again, but there are some cases where the logical distance between the address of the victim and the aggressor are three apart. There are some cases, there are seven apart. And we tried to analyze this phenomenon. Later on, we looked at the reverse engineering of mapping in some other paper. We have a paper in DSN in 2016 that looks at these effects and also data-dependent failures. Other people also reverse engineered this mapping. So this is very interesting, but it's good to know that uh, uh, they're, they're not adjacent completely. And it looks, at the it looks like the green one is also mostly adjacent, as you can see. So they're mostly logically adjacent, but not always. There's some internal remapping that's going on in DRAM. This is going to be interesting because this is going to affect the solutions, right? If you have a memory controller based solution, uh, as I will describe, uh, that's intelligent, you cannot assume that victim and the aggressor are actually logically adjacent to each other uh, for, uh, from the point of view of the addresses that the memory controller sees, right? If you're not exposed to the physical addresses internally in DRAM, you may not be able to solve the problem completely. Okay, but mostly they're adjacent, but there are some cases where uh, things are not adjacent. Okay, so let's take a look at another uh, uh, parameter. Uh, this is the access interval to the aggressor. How, how, uh, what is the distance in terms of time between two consecutive activates uh, that you send to the same row? In DDR3 chips that we tested, uh, this part was not allowed. That's out of specific specification, basically. Specification says uh, TRC is 52.5 nanoseconds, basically. Uh, of course, clearly, as you increase this, as you increase the distance between activates, you will see fewer and fewer errors, right? And at some point, you will see no errors because you're not doing enough activates within a refresh interval. And we wanted to stretch it and figure out what is the maximum you, could do, you should do for this. And it turns out the maximum is very high. Basically, you need to space the activates by 500 nanoseconds to the same row. And that's not very good because if you actually, if this is a solution, you lose a lot of performance, right? You don't want to do this. Of course, there is a variance uh, uh, between different manufacturers and between different chips. These are the worst chips of each of the manufacturers. But basically the takeaway is if you access the same row less frequently, you get fewer errors. And there is a point where you will get no errors. And this could potentially be a solution. But this is not an easy solution, I think. Okay, the other uh, parameter that I'm going to show you is the refresh interval. How frequently do we refresh the uh, At the time, uh, the chips required uh, uh, refreshes to every cell every 64 milliseconds. Clearly, if you increase the refresh rate, reduce the refresh interval, you should see fewer errors, right? Because you can put only uh, so many activates, a smaller number of activates in a smaller refresh interval. 
And that's essentially what we see. But of course, if you increase the refresh interval, which is what we really want to do actually, right, as we discussed, we want to get rid of refreshes, you see even more errors. So uh, getting, more, getting rid of refreshes goes against the Rohammer solutions. Um, so basically, uh, one solution to Rohammer is refreshing the chips more frequently. So how much more frequently? If you want to get rid of all of the errors that you see, that we have seen, and, it, and, and I will remind you that we didn't really do the most aggressive testing. Google folks actually increased the, uh, the power of the attack, and later other folks also increased the power of the attack by doing this double-sided hammering and other tricks. Uh, but according to our results, our testing at that time, you have to increase the refreshes by 7x to get rid of every single error. I think that's terrible. We don't want to, we don't want to uh, in increase the refresh by any amount, but if you want to solve the problem completely, get rid of all the bit flips, you have to increase it by 7x according to our results. And I believe this is actually worse because our attack was not the most powerful, as I said. So keep, in, keep this in mind because this is the solution that's employed today because this is the configurability we have in memory controllers out in the field today. We can change the refresh rate. And as a result, by increasing the refresh rate, we can get fewer errors, but maybe we're not getting rid of all the errors by changing the refresh rate today. Because as far as I know, there is no controller that can change the refresh rate by 7x. Most of the controllers can go down to 4x. Maybe there are some that are there that can uh, go to 8x, but I don't think the solutions employed actually go uh, change the refresh rate to it. 8x more frequent. Okay, this is another interesting observation. Uh, so data pattern matters, basically. If you have this sort of data pattern in memory, and if you hammer a row, you're not as likely to get errors compared to this sort of data pattern. Basically, you get 10x, an order of magnitude more errors in this case, because you have much more capacitive coupling between the cells. One, some of them are charged, some of them are discharged, and there's a huge capacitive coupling that you have that you normally don't have with solid data patterns like this. And this is not necessarily the best data pattern, of course. This is the best data pattern that we tested, but there could be much worse data patterns. And the paper that I mentioned in DSN 2016 talks about the data patterns uh, quite a bit. So uh, if you want to launch this attack, you actually want to prime your memory such that you change your data patterns uh, to maximize the coupling. And other people later explored this data pattern and they found similar uh, issues. So clearly, errors are affected by data stored in other cells because of this capacitive coupling. Okay, there are other results in the paper which are also very interesting. So the victim cells, the cells that are vulnerable to Rohammer, has almost, have almost no overlap uh, with the cells that are weak. Weak meaning the cells that are very leaky in terms of refresh, the cells that need to be refreshed much more often. This is interesting. Basically, this uh, points out to the fact that uh, these are two completely different error mechanisms failure mechanisms. Leakage uh, through the transistor uh, is different from the Rohammer vulnerability. This is something we didn't completely expect, but later we got to understood that uh, these are completely uh, different error mechanisms. It's interesting, right? <laughs> because both are charged leakage problems, but they're triggered by very different mechanisms in the end. One is triggered by essentially natural charge leakage. You don't do anything and charge leaks, and the other is triggered by this hammering. Okay, the second uh, observation is also interesting. Uh, errors are not strongly affected by temperature uh, as far as what we found. There is some effect of temperature. As you increase the temperature, you get more vulnerability, but it's not as strong. If you look at refresh, as we will see, as you increase the temperature, leakage increases exponentially, so you need to increase the refresh rate significantly. But it's not the case in Rohammer. Although this needs to be re-examined at very high temperatures, I think, uh, going forward, because some of the solutions that are employed in the field right now may work at low temperatures, but not, not at high temperatures. Uh, this is what makes the security problem actually. Errors are repeatable. Basically, uh, this is one data point from the paper, but basically, if, you, if, you, if you're able to cause an error in a cell, you're very likely to cause an error in the cell again and again and again and again. And that's what makes the security problem, because now someone can figure out which cells are vulnerable slowly over time somehow, and then keep a record of it and eventually launch an attack on those cells. Uh, we, uh, we showed that simple error correcting codes cannot actually fix the problem. Uh, basically, simple error correcting codes are, uh, that are employed uh, with the ninth chip in the DIMM that I discussed yesterday. Essentially, sim single error correcting, double error detecting codes. Uh, because sometimes we get as many as four errors per cache line. It's not as frequent, but you do get them, essentially. You don't completely close the vulnerability with simple error correcting codes. And I think this problem is getting worse. Uh, it's going to... Uh, Rohammer is getting, getting worse in future technology, so it's not clear 
uh, if you want to solve the problem with error correcting codes, you need to have really strong error correcting codes. Uh, and actually, uh, it's, it's funny. Uh, manufacturers claim that ECC is the solution to row hammer for a long time. And we always argue that that's not the solution to row hammer for m multiple reasons. One is this, you need to make it stronger. Uh, and even if this was the solution, it's a very uh, heavy handed solution, right? This is a very specific error mechanism. Uh, ECC is very good at uh, protecting for errors that you don't know how they happen, right? You could design a solution for row hammer that's much cheaper than ECC. Error correcting codes, you're basically protecting all of your memory with some number of bits. That's very wasteful, we'll get back to that. But even uh, beyond that, uh, like I, I gave this talk in International Symposium on uh, high performance computing at some point and I talked about row hammer. The next person who talked about row, uh, uh, got on the stage, uh, he was talking about something else. He was from Micron. He shall remain nameless. <laughs> but basically what he said was, I have a solution uh, to row hammer. And then he said, it's called ECC. <laughs> okay, you should look at the ECC Ploid paper uh, from uh, IEEE Security and Privacy this year. Basically these folks showed that even in ECC chips, they could uh, launch a row hammer attack. This is actually a beautiful paper. Uh, they called ECC Ploid. Uh, so even with ECC, you could launch these attacks. But we knew that it was, uh, ECC was not the solution. And I think fundamentally, you know, from a principled manner, you don't want ECC to be solving this problem as we will discuss. Okay, uh, this is also very interesting. I think this is going to be w worse in the future. A uh, number of cells and rows affected by an aggressor is a lot. Basically, you're affecting a lot of cells. These are the worst cases, of course. And you're affecting a lot of rows also. It's not just the adjacent rows. I don't think anyone has shown that you could launch an attack in non-adjacent rows today, but maybe in the future, if the problem is not solved, you could potentially uh, launch an attack. So it's not just the adjacent rows. You have effects on further rows, but the effect actually goes down exponentially. This actually is similar to uh, what we found in flash. In flash memory, when you have read disturb uh, or interference across the cells, uh, as you go uh, across multiple rows, effects uh, of interference goes on exponentially. Okay, uh, and also uh, this is another observation that I said uh, Google exploited cells are affected by two aggressor or an easier site uh, and basically Google folks took advantage of this. And this is the original paper. I didn't assign this, I assigned this uh, other paper for your reading. So this is your required reading. Has anyone started doing the reading? Or is it too early? Okay, great. Have you finished it? No. Okay, it's, is it interesting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is interesting because it's really a retrospective in the end. It covers, as far as we know, all of the interesting research that we could find uh, over the last five years that built on row hammer. But again, it's not comprehensive because I just found out about this ram bleed attack yesterday. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so let's talk about solutions. Any questions so far? Is this fascinating? Okay, I think I still find this fascinating. Actually, we're looking at uh, even more aggressively scaled chips and the problem is getting worse. But of course people are developing solutions right now. They're not just sitting uh, waiting for these errors to slip into the field. I think that opportunity is gone, but the question is how do you find a good solution to the problem? Uh, so th I think there are two types of row hammer solutions that are needed. One is immediate. Immediate meaning the chips are out there in the field, they're vulnerable, what do you do with them, right? You need to protect them basically. Uh, but there are limited possibilities for that. And the reason we have limited possibilities, in my opinion, is because we don't have intelligence in the memory controllers that are out there. We didn't really anticipate these issues. As a result, our controllers are very rigid. They are not programmable. For example, in the, in the CPUs, we can have microcode patches. You can argue they're good or they're bad, but they fix some of the bugs in the CPUs that are discovered afterwards. Uh, you can have a microcode patch that changes the instruction ordering, for example, or that executes different types of instructions so that it doesn't exercise the bug. That's some sort of programmability. But in the memory control, we don't have any other option, uh, any, any such option. Well, we have some option which is changing the refresh rate and that's going to be the immediate solution. But longer term solution needs to be more principled uh, because it requires protecting future DRAM chips. And now we can also enable a wider range of protection mechanisms by thinking ahead. Right? So this, uh, that, that's why I like dividing these into immediate and longer term solutions. And the, ISCA paper proposes both types of solutions. Actually, there are seven solutions in total. I'm gonna to go over some of them. Uh, some of them are not uh, as nice, I think. Like ECC, I don't like it as much as we will discuss. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about the best solution. Uh, it's a probabilistic approach. It's already employed in the field in a limited manner. 
Uh, but I think there needs to be more to be done to employ something like this. Okay, these are some potential solutions. Uh, ma uh, make better DRAM chips. <laughs> this could be basically use some other material that's not, that's, that provide better isolation, right? Actually, people looked at this a lot. It's much more costly to find some other material. Uh, and it also requires changing the huge infrastructure of DRAM. It, and, and DRAM infrastructure has scaled over the course of 50 years, actually 54 years to be exact. Over the course of 54 years, people have perfect this infrastructure. If you go move into some other material, it's going to be extremely costly. You need to change the entire infrastructure, basically. So this is not going to be an easy solution. It's not, it's, there is no single device level or circuit level patch to this problem. Uh, the second solution over here is refresh frequently. And we discussed this already. This is a reasonable solution. If you actually, a, a reasonable solution in the immediate term, uh, basically you increase the refresh rate across the board, you reduce the vulnerable tears. But as I said, this requires a lot of refreshes. We would like to get rid of that, actually. But if you really want se to security, this may be the only reasonable immediate solution that you have. The third solution is sophisticated ECC. As I said, error correcting codes are very good at, so if you don't know the cause of an error, if it's a random error that just happens randomly, error correcting codes are a great fit for those. If you get, let, let's say, one bit flip, or two bit flips, or four bit flips, you have some sophisticated DCC that corrects those and you protect your entire memory because you care about correcting these errors. But this is a very, uh, this is an error mechanism, failure mechanism that we know really well, right? You know that it doesn't happen randomly. You know that you need to hammer something for a long time to be able to induce these errors. Why use a very broad heavyweight solution to fix the problem? And as, again, as I said, I don't think a very simple ECC fixes the problem. You need to be more sophisticated. So this is very uh, costly in terms of overhead. It's important for other issues like variable retention time. I think variable retention time is, this, uh, is a problem that can be solved with ECC because it's completely random as far as we know. Okay, access counter is also very interesting. Uh, the idea is to count the number of accesses you're doing to rows. And if you think some rows exceed the threshold, refresh those rows. So this sounds like a reasonable idea. The problem is how do you do this? I think uh, the devil is in the details of the implementation here. How do you actually uh, design these counters such that you don't have counters for every single row in DRAM? Because that's unacceptable, right? That's a lot of overhead in your memory controller. But if you reduce the size of the counters, how do you ensure that you're counting enough things? And I think this is possible, but it still requires uh, overhead. And people actually developed some solutions. Uh, to this, there is some literature on this. Uh, I believe there's a paper that's coming up in ISCA that talks about reducing the cost of the access counter-based solutions, for example. So there needs to be more research in this one. But I think all of these solutions, actually, when we talked about them in the uh, ISCA paper, we said these are not as desirable. So we wanted to go a different way. And the different way we looked at, uh, so actually, this is some, for, some form of intelligence in the memory controller also. It's really uh, trying to adapt the error correction mechanisms to, uh, to the failure mechanism at hand. So I, I like the solution. I don't like the overhead that comes with it. Uh, so it's a, it's a more principled solution than uh, these two. Of course, we don't know how to do this at this point. Uh, so okay, some naive solutions, throttle access to the same row. If you have perfect counters, you throttle, uh, you, you, or you, you always throttle access to the same row. This is not a good solution. Refresh more frequently. Again, that's not a good solution. That's what we said. We basically, both naive solutions introduce significant overhead in performance and power. But what do you do in the field right now? The immediate solution that's employed in the field is essentially refreshing frequently. I like this uh, uh, from Apple's security release about Rohammer. Basically, they said that uh, to mitigate Rohammer, we increase the memory refresh rates. And they were nice, basically. They clearly admitted the problem. And they uh, gave credit to Google as well as our work which is really the, how industry should be doing things when they release something. Some other industry was not as nice, <laughs> as you can see. You can put IBM over here also. <laughs> basically, they employed the solution learning about the problem, but then uh, they didn't talk about it as much, basically. Uh, I mean, Apple also didn't talk about it as much, as you can see. Right? They didn't say how by how much they increase the memory refresh rates. I believe it's 2x. Uh, 2x doesn't close the vulnerability completely, in my opinion. Uh, but again, this is one potential solution, right? And this is, in my opinion, this is the only thing that you can do out in the field that's easy to do. Other people have so proposed software-based solutions. The, the Anvil paper that I mentioned in ASPLOS 2016, basically, they use performance counters 
to detect these cases where you're actually hammering a row. This is a bit intrusive because now you need to monitor the performance counters and you need to find out good thresholds. Uh, and also there's overhead in terms of software monitoring of this. Uh, I believe that could be a solution, but it's really uh, overhead <laughs> in the end. So those software-based solutions, I think uh, it's good to research them, but it's not clear if a software-based solution completely can solve the problem without assistance from hardware. If you have some hardware assistance, then maybe a software-based solution could be good to employ. But I think uh, we, have, we may have some simpler solutions to this problem. Of course, in immediate chips, it's either software-based or you increase the memory refresh rates. Okay, our solution, let me tell you our solution. Our solution requires also slightly more intelligence in the, uh, in the memory controller. And the idea is very simple, basically. We called it probabilistic adjacent row activation, para. The memory controller, after it closes a row, with very low probability, it activates one or both of its neighbors, adjacent, physically adjacent neighbors. And you can set the probability, it's programmable. We looked at different values of that probability and uh, resulting vulnerabilities based on that probability. So you could, for example, do five uh, out of a thousand activates. Uh, and this is activates across all of the rows. You don't need to count activates to a given row. Uh, every uh, five activates over uh, a thousand activates, you're closing a row. You basically refresh the adjacent rows. Actually, I should say precharges probably, right? Uh, every five precharges out of a thousand precharges, you, uh, you, you, you activate the adjacent rows. Uh, and this gives you a very good reliability guarantee, which is much better than hard disks. So of course, you should select P reasonably. Uh, and if you're actually paranoid, you could easily adjust P. You could say, I'm going to do this uh, one out of 100 activates, right? Or one out of 10 activates. Of course, your overhead increases if you do it. But this gives you uh, a knob. And we showed that uh, with a really good reliability guarantee that close the vulnerability, uh, your uh, overheads are relatively low. You slow down applications, but you don't slow down by that much. And also, the more important thing is you, this is really stateless. Stateless in the sense that you don't need to count the accesses to rows. You just need to have a counter telling you how many activates you've done so far, how, or how many precharges you've done so far, right? That's another thing. Basically, after, uh, after closing a row, you need to do this. Uh, okay, uh, so there are multiple implementations. That's why I said activates and uh, precharges, but you get the basic idea, right? If, uh, you, whenever you're closing a row, you activate the adjacent rows. Uh, and it's a, we showed that it's a low overhead solution. So it doesn't need any state. Uh, it doesn't even need a random number generator, actually. You don't need to do this randomly if your frequency is high enough. But actually, random number generators are very interesting. Uh, how, to do, how to generate random numbers in memory is very, very interesting, and we're going to talk about that as well. OK, so uh, what is the catch? Uh, there is a catch. First of all, you need to change the hardware. Uh, but you could do this actually in a DRAM chip or, or in a memory controller. And both solutions are implemented today. Maybe not in the exact way we envisioned them to be implemented. So how do you implement in a DRAM chip? If you have enough slack and timing parameters, meaning that uh, the memory controller is waiting uh, for longer than it really needs to wait, internally the DRAM chip manufacturer knows this, and the manufacturer can sneak in a refresh to an adjacent row. Because it knows that the memory controller is not going to issue a command. And it knows that there's slack in the timing parameter, because that's built in slack. And we're going to analyze that when we talk about latency. You can do this. So there's plenty of slack today. And as a result, uh, some manufacturers exploit that slack in refreshes to do more refreshes to some rows that they deem to be vulnerable in some way. They don't exactly disclose how it is, but it's somewhat similar uh, to para. OK, so that's one place to implement. Uh, I don't think this is a good solution, at least with the current DRAM interfaces, because it relies on the slack and the timing parameters. Right? And actually, we want to get rid of that slack as much as possible in the timing parameters, because uh, what is that slack? So slack says, basically, after you issue an activate, you need to wait for, uh, um, let's say, I don't know, 15 nanoseconds for a read. Uh, we know that we don't really need to wait for 15 nanoseconds, but the manufacturer specifies that. We actually need to wait for, I don't know, eight nanoseconds, let's say. So we could actually reduce the latency by getting rid of that slack. We could actually improve performance. That's exactly what we propose over here. We don't want that slack. We want to get rid of refreshes. We want to get rid of slack also. So you cannot use these as solutions to the reliability problems. So what do you do? Basically, I think this is a better solution. If you're implementing this solution in the memory controller is much better. Uh, 
the memory controller basically figures out when to uh, do this probabilistic adjacent row activation. But this requires one key thing we discussed before. The memory controller needs to know which rows are physically adjacent, right? And that information is not really provided to the memory controller today. The memory controller actually can guess logically adjacent rows in the address space are also physically adjacent, but that will just be a guess, right? That, or the memory controller essentially reverse engineers which rows are physically adjacent. And that's the security community did that actually. A lot of security folks, uh, there's this paper called Drama, I think in uh, Unix security in 2016. Essentially it uh, reverse engineers the DRM address mappings so that they can launch better row hammer attacks. <laughs> you could actually use that same reverse engineering to figure out which rows are physically adjacent. I don't think those techniques are fully perfect uh, because they may not be able to catch all of the rows that are physically adjacent because it's not very easy actually uh, to do that. But you could potentially reverse engineer. But a better interface would fix this problem. Basically, if the DRAM manufacturer told, uh, told the memory controller, memory controller, these are the rows that are adjacent and this is a function that I use internally to remap my addresses, it's very easy to fix this problem. Better yet, you have a memory controller that manages the DRAM, right? An intelligent memory controller that's designed together with DRAM. It knows exactly what it is. You don't need to expose it to anyone else. That's essentially the core architecting the memory controllers and DRAM together to fix the scaling issues, actually. That's, that's, that's what I've been arguing for yesterday. Now, that said, uh, this solution is also implemented in the memory controller. If you have this Intel machine, this is a relatively recent machine. Uh, I think it's Lenovo. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. Anyway. Uh, I don't remember, there are a bunch of these machines. But in the BIOS, uh, you can s pick your row hammer protection, row hammer solution. You can either choose 2x refresh, apparently in this particular machine, or you could pick your hardware row hammer protection. And apparently Intel put some support that's very similar to probabilistic adjacent row activation, uh, where you can choose uh, after how many activations uh, you activate the adjacent rows. You can choose every 512 or every other one. If you do every other one, probably it's going to be very bad for your performance and energy. But you, could, you have the choice now. So we're moving forward in the right direction, basically. The memory control is slightly more intelligent, except this is not what we exactly envisioned, but this is an easy way of uh, incorporating a potential solution. The catch is, how does Intel know which rows are physically adjacent? As far as I know, there is no communication between the memory to the memory controller. So my guess is they're really banking on the fact that most logically adjacent addresses are also physically adjacent, as we've shown in our paper. But in cases where that's not true, you're still vulnerable. Okay, uh, so if you want to know more about the solutions, you can uh, read the paper, there are more solutions. But I think a key takeaway is we want more intelligent controllers for security. And I think these issues will increase and increase. There will be other security problems as we will discuss tomorrow. Uh, and as I said, industry is writing papers about it too, and they're also pushing, uh, asking for intelligent memory controllers, co-architecting controllers and DRAM. And we, as I mentioned, we already have these intelligent controllers. These flash controllers are actually very intelligent in the sense that they handle the reliability issues in an intelligent manner. So they have a lot of ECC, but they reserve the ECC uh, for more random errors. Uh, for re-disturb errors, they employ different solutions for, and I would recommend reading this paper for the different solutions that are employed for different types of error mechanisms. Uh, I don't have a copy of that, but we have a, we have a table uh, in this uh, paper that shows the different error mechanisms on the x-axis and different solutions on the y-axis and which ones are employed for which error mechanisms. So you, you really need to choose and pick and choose your error mechanisms such that you're efficient in handling the errors. Okay, so this is the key takeaway. <laughs> We're gonna talk about this more tomorrow and make things even more intelligent. But I think there is a huge challenge and opportunity for the future that's beyond intelligent memory controls. We want really fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe computing architectures, especially with things like Meltdown and Spectre. We actually, this is becoming more and more important uh, going into the future. And I don't have time to talk about Meltdown and Spectre, but they're also fascinating. So let me talk about one of the solution directions. I think we need to really th rethink how we architect uh, computing systems such that they're more fundamentally secure. The way we are doing it right now is security is not a, third class concern, maybe it's a fourth class concern today, but it's moving up in the hierarchy, I think, especially in hardware design, it needs to be a first class concern. So we need to somehow predict and prevent such safety issues. Uh, I think that requires understanding and modeling with experiments for sure. We need to somehow understand the issues, in memory at least, 
And that has enabled, uh, I think this understanding will enable us to model better. And uh, recall the collapse of the, we, I, I said that we're gonna get back to this. But this is interesting. Uh, this is not an isolated case. Things happened. Does anybody remember this one? This is in Korea and Seoul, the, the big Han River. This actually had a lot of fatalities in 1994. This is in Minneapolis, also fatalities. This is in Genoa, closer to here in 2018, also fatalities. So it seems like we're repeating the past. Although I think bridges are much more reliable, <laughs> but still. So I think uh, in, in computers we have one solution that's not easily applicable to bridges. We're much more soft. If we make things more programmable, we can prevent some of these issues, right? I think the solution that I will propose is going to be different from what the solution should be for bridges probably. Basically, we need some patchability in the memory controllers, uh, in intelligence in the memory controllers. If we had a programmable memory controller that we could patch in the field, I think Rohammer would not be a huge problem uh, today. But we, since we don't have that, it is a huge problem. I think going forward, if we have uh, this infield patchability, which is one of the principles, I think, for security, uh, we need that. Actually, we wrote a paper in 2008 or so on hardware bugs. This was published in Micro 2008. And we argued for exactly the same thing for processors. Basically, the processor, you have discovered the bugs later on. These bugs can be security vulnerabilities, reliability vulnerabilities, whatever. People actually showed that they could be security vulnerabilities also. We argued for a processor design saying that you need to be able to patch these bugs. Basically, you need to be able to have a signature of the bugs that can be shipped into the processor and the processor has a mechanism to match that signature to a particular system state that it's in. And when it goes into a system state that exercises that bug, it basically employs a solution. That's a patchable hardware design. Of course, overheads are high, uh, and not a lot of research has been done since then in that area. I believe that need, research needs to be revived. And I think that's true for memory controllers also. This is a paper in Micro 2008, if you're interested. We analyzed real processors and the bugs in the real processors and uh, developed this patching mechanism. So given that we have very little time left, let me give you some final thoughts. And maybe you can uh, think about some questions while I'm giving you the final thoughts. So I think this is really interesting. Uh, this was fascinating for me. This is, I'm gonna show you the same slide. It's really a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And I think how to exploit and fix the vulnerability requires a strong understanding across the transformation layers. Uh, I don't buy, and I know we're both the DRAM manufacturers saying ECC is the solution, for example. Uh, maybe that's their solution, but it's really not based on a strong understanding of uh, the, uh, ac across the transformation layers. ECC may be the tool that you know of, but it's not necessarily a great solution. Right? And I think fixing needs to happen for two types of chips, as we discussed, existing chips and future chips. And mechanisms for fixing are different between the two types. Let me give you an aside actually here. This is really interesting. Do, uh, do people here know about Byzantine failures? You've studied distributed systems, Byzantine failures. These are actually really bad failures. Uh, actually, this, this class of failures are all, no, all known as Byzantine failures. What is a Byzantine failure? It's characterized by undetected erroneous computation. Basically, you have some computation, you have a fault, but you haven't detected that fault. It's the opposite of a fundamental principle for reliability, which is fail fast. Basically, if you have an error, fail fast. Either give an error or give no result. Don't continue the computation, basically, in an undetected manner. Because if you continue the computation, this could be used for basically a system crash, something not so malicious, but it could be used for something malicious also, right? Uh, basically, erroneous can be malicious, and the only distinction is really the intent of the attacker. If you have an attacker that's malicious, like they can use these errors uh, for their benefit. And it's very difficult to detect and confine these Byzantine failures, so you really need to do all you can to avoid these things. And if you're really interested in the general theoretical problem of the Byzantine generals, I would recommend this Leslie Lamport's uh, fundamental paper on the Byzantine generals problem that talks about basically how to, uh, bas that lays the stage of these undetected failures. Like there's a Byzantine general that's a traitor essentially that does something erroneous and how do you actually still keep uh, generating useful results in the presence of these generals that are traitors. You could think of the Rohammers as traitors, right? They're really destroying some data erroneously. Intent, you don't know, it could be an error, but error can be used maliciously by someone. Okay, so essentially, uh, as I said, it's the first example of a how, how a simple hardware failure mechanism can create a widespread system security vulnerability. So this retrospective is partly in the paper also, but I want to go through it. 
the interesting thing is, I think, uh, as I said, uh, people knew about the importance of bit flips, but nobody simulated them <laughs> to generate attacks, right? Until somebody came up with these bit flips in the real life. So basically, this enabled a new mindset uh, and a renewed interest in hardware security attack research. Essentially showing that real memory chips are vulnerable and you can induce these errors. Uh, enabled other people show, to show that this caused real security problems and there are many attacks. And this also linked, hard, uh, linked the connection between the hardware reliability and security. And I think this has become more mainstream discourse right now. That's why you're seeing all of these attacks publicized widely. And there are many new raw hammer attacks. You should read the paper for uh, a broad overview. But if you really want to get to know the attacks, uh, read the papers that I mentioned. There are tens of papers in top security venues. And I believe there's more to come as Rover Hammer is getting worse. It is true that at the lower levels, the issue is getting worse. The number of activates that you need to do to induce Rover Hammer is reducing at the lower levels. But it's not, it may not be completely exposed outside right now because clearly memory manufacturers and memory controller designers are not dumb, right? They're gonna fix the issue and they're gonna close the vulnerability as much as possible. But again, if they make some mistakes in closing the vulnerability, that opens a hole. And I believe there needs to be more attacks that need to be done to show that there are vulnerabilities in uh, future chips. It may not be as easy. The barrier to entry to a Rohammer attack research is not going to be as easy in DDR4 and maybe DDR5. But I think solution research can still go on to be much more efficient. Uh, there are many new Rohammer solutions. Clearly, Apple security release Memtest 86, for example. And there are many solution proposed in top venues also. Some of them are software-based. But I think the real uh, soft, uh, solutions should have some more principled system DRAM co-design. Uh, basically, we cannot rely on business as usual uh, to solve the problem like refresh or ECC. And I believe more to come in the, uh, there's more to come in the Rohammer solutions as well. But perhaps most importantly, I think the shift of mindset is important because, as I said, nobody was simulating these. Uh, but now people know that general purpose hardware is fallible in a widespread manner. Right? Uh, its problems are also exploitable. And I believe this mindset has enabled many system security researchers to examine hardware in more depth. And I think this is a really good thing. Uh, people should really examine hardware in more depth because there is uh, the attack surface is getting lower and lower. Uh, and there is a huge attack service in the hardware uh, domain. Uh, and people understood the hardware's inner workings and vulnerabilities. And I believe that there's no coincidence I actually interacted with many of these folks who developed Meltdown and Spectre. And these folks actually heavily worked on Rohammer before. And they got really interested in the, how the hardware works internally and they went on and figured out Meltdown and Spectre. Uh, at least two of the groups, not all of them clearly because multiple groups that worked on Meltdown and Spectre. And they're still working on it there. You see multiple attacks. Uh, that are coming uh, with Meltdown and Spectre also, or variants of them. And there's more to come, I think, as people figure out these vulnerabilities in hardware. Because hardware is really des not designed with that mindset. The design mindset was, how do we get the highest performance? And you cannot blame that mindset because that's how it is, right? That's actually how we taught classes also, because nobody think thought that these would be a attack surface uh, 30 years later, if the concepts were developed. The design mindset has to change to fundamentally protect the hardware clearly. But until that changes, it's important to actually discover these issues to understand what are the parts of the hardware or what are the parts of the uh, design that are vulnerable and what is causing those vulnerabilities and figuring out the principles to fix those vulnerabilities. Because I don't believe that we have the solution to Spectre, for example. Meltdown is easier to solve because the vulnerability is really, uh, Meltdown is about basically not doing a security check early enough in the pipeline and that enables an access to a, a, a location that you don't have privileged access to. Okay, you do the security check, you fix the problem, that's easy. But Spectre is much more fundamental. Basically, it's not about a security check. By pure speculation, you actually bring data into the cache that you're not supposed to bring. You're not violating anything over there. Uh, so it's very hard to uh, fix this problem at, uh, without losing a lot of performance. So we don't really have the principles to actually provide security at high performance at this point. And that, those principles need to be developed uh, going forward. Okay, let me summarize and then you can ask questions maybe. Hopefully you will have some questions. So uh, basically DRAM reliability is reducing. There's no doubt about that. And these reliability issues open up security vulnerabilities. And these are very hard to defend against. Romehammer is a prime example. 
And as I said, it's the first example of a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And as I said, uh, this implications on system security research are tremendous and exciting. Uh, and also hardware research, clearly, but I didn't uh, put it over here. The bad news is rope hammer is getting worse at the lower levels, uh, but at the interface level, it may not be getting worse. Uh, uh, the good news is we have a lot more to do. I think that's good for research, right? Especially people who are working on hardware security today uh, and the interaction between uh, new hardware and uh, security. So we're now fully aware that hardware is easily fallable. We cannot make the same mistake again. Basically. We cannot assume that hardware is not fallable. That time is gone. Uh, I think Rovehammer erased the time where people thought that memory is good. <laughs> it's not good. There are clearly errors. It's fallible. And I think uh, we, in general, the security community and hardware community, are developing both attacks and solutions. And I think this is a very healthy mindset uh, going forward. The key question is, can we discover the principles that, uh, that will enable us much safer and much more secure systems that are also high performance, energy efficient. And the hope is that we will get to those principal models, methodologies, and solutions. But there's a lot more work to be done, of course, over here in these two sentences. OK, and that's uh, one of the reasons why I assigned this paper to you. So hopefully, you'll enjoy it. And I'll leave you with this slide over here. <laughs> so any questions? Or did I hammer you? enough that your bits have flipped and you, don't, you forgot what questions you were going to ask. I think we have time. Well, officially we don't have time, but nobody is really waiting outside this time. No? Maybe think about it a little bit. OK, I mean, you can, of course, feel free to ask me questions over email or tomorrow or next week. So I'll be around. Maybe you can let it sink in, read the paper. Maybe you'll develop some new attack. Who knows? OK, what time are we meeting tomorrow? Is it 10 again? OK, I guess I'll see you at 10 tomorrow then. And hopefully we'll have our AC tomorrow. But